So, so just to flesh it out a little bit for our listeners. So this is what I was taught as I was, you know, serving on a prophetic team, right? There was a ministry Mm -hmm. at the end of the church service. Anybody who wanted to receive a prophetic word could come receive a prophetic word. They would have teams of individuals, you know, two or three um, individuals and each prophetic kind of booth. They would actually set up booths in the back of the sanctuary and people would come we would record the words so that they could take it back with them. And there would always be a leader of each of these teams, somebody who is more trained and more experienced in the prophetic. And that's how we would do it. Now, the, the theme verse was always going to be from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that prophecy is for the encouragement, the comfort, all right, the, the mm-hmm. edification. Mm-hmm. Now, now, they would interpret that to say prophecy is always positive. Whereas I would look and I'd say, well, prophecy is always encouraging and comforting and edifying. Um, but the Lord has edified me greatly um, in very painful ways. Um, mm-hmm. The Lord has comforted me great, greatly, um, but, but also in ways that caused me to have to lose my sin. I'm reminded of, um, I believe it's the Psalms. I can't remember exactly which one. It may be Proverbs, actually, but it says, When you rebuke a man for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. And uh, mm-hmm. it's painful. And it's like something that is dear to you is being eaten and devoured before your eyes. And so the Lord does this, but he does it for our edification, for our building up. The Mm -hmm. Lord builds us up, um, but often as he is building us up, he is removing the dross. It's like iron sharpening iron, right? That is sharpening. That is um, edifying, but it's painful or removing the dross. It's it's like silver in a cauldron or gold in the fire, the furnace. It's it's hot. It's, it's, It's painful. And so anyways... Um, but they would interpret that, you know, first Corinthians 14 positive. It always needs to be something positive, you know? So the prophetic words would always go something like this. The Lord likes you. The Lord just really likes you, you know, or the Lord really loves you. (laughs) And so they would, you know, those, those kinds of things. And, you know, and then they would also bifurcate and say, well, you know, underneath this prophetic banner, there is, you know, words of knowledge. There are also words of wisdom. Now the word of wisdom would be like instruction. The word of knowledge would be like information. So a word of knowledge would be like, like a download of some kind of information, some kind of data, specific data about the individual that you could not otherwise know, like their name. Is your name Sarah, right? And, and you've never met the individual before, and so presumably you, know, you, you got this from the Lord. And so you know, a word of wisdom would be more so instruction, like you know, um, I think the Lord wants you to pursue such and such career, or I think, you know, and always, again, on, in the light of something positive, that they're going to really, really enjoy this. And so you don't get a lot of pushback, right? Because here's the thing. They, they tend to stay vague. So there's always going to be about a about hundred words of wisdom using their framework for every word of knowledge, right? Because the word of knowledge can be tested, right? You try to guess a person's first name, you get it wrong and blammo, you know, you're caught, right? Caught red-handed. But the word of wisdom is, is you know, the instruction can always be more vague. I think you need to do this, you know, or and, and it's something vague that's really hard to, and it's always positive also. So the person doesn't really have the desire to object, right? Because basically what you're doing is you're just, you're, you're looking at a person and complimenting them. That's really what it boils down. You're giving the person a spiritual compliment and there's not a lot of people who are antagonistic towards compliments. So, so everybody usually, you know, handles it just fine. Um, that being said, here was the framework for prophecy. They would say prophecy is revelation, interpretation, application, revelation, interpretation, application. And so they would say the revelation, you know, and they would say this is the same thing with teaching, right? So they would say, if you're teaching the Bible, if a pastor is teaching the Bible, it is revelation, interpretation, application. And I would actually agree with this. And they would say the revelation in the case of the gift of teaching is infallible the re- because the revelation is the written word of God, right? You don't come before the people and say, I have a dream or I have an idea or I have a a vision, you come before the people of God on the Lord's day and say, I have a text. And if you don't have a text, then you can go ahead and sit down. But I have a text. I have a revelation and it's not man's revelation. It's God's revelation. It's perfect. Um, and then we're going to interpretation. It's very much like the Puritan view of, of the pulpit. You know, that there's the revelation. It's the word of God. There's exegesis there. The interpretation, drawing out the doctrines from the text and being able to flesh out those doctrines. 
And then application, right? The sermon actually gives people something to do. Therefore, go and, right? And it's not, your, it's not legalism. We're not telling someone to do something in order to merit the favor of God, but to do something because they have the free favor of God by the work of Christ through faith. And so because, not, not to, to gain salvation, but because of salvation, here's how we apply today's text in our marriage and our parenting and our vocation, all these different things. So revelation, interpretation, application, in the realm of teaching, the revelation is the Bible. In the realm of prophecy, the revelation may be a dream. It may be a vision. Um, it may be uh, an audible voice or an inner audible voice is language that they would often use. An inner audible voice, you know, that nobody else could hear, but you could hear, but it's not your own voice, the voice of your thoughts. But that's another form of revelation is your thoughts, right? Because the Holy Spirit may be guiding your thoughts. So it could be an an audible voice from God, it could be an inner audible voice that is not your voice, it's God's voice, it's distinct, but no one else could hear it. Or it could be your own voice of your thoughts, but being guided by the Holy Spirit. Or it could be a dream, or it could be a vision, or it could be a picture. That's another thing. Dreams and visions may have moving, like stock motion moving, but it could just be an image, right? It could be a still shot picture in your mind. And then all these things are the revelation, and they would claim in, under the banner of New Testament prophecy, the revelation, again, is infallible because if God speaks, God doesn't speak fallibly. God, if God speaks, he speaks infallibly. His, his speech is perfect, and God doesn't speak arbitrarily. He, so he doesn't speak out of both sides of his mouth. He doesn't contradict himself. God is not a man that he should lie or that he should change his mind. So he speaks infallibly, perfectly, um, not arbitrarily, and he speaks authoritatively. He doesn't speak um, something that's trivial. So it, it's whatever he has to say, there's a reason he's saying it. It matters. And just like teaching, the revelation is the written word of God and has no faults, no flaws. Well, in prophecy, New Testament prophecy, the revelation is the dream or the vision or the inner voice or, or whatever it might be. And that too is from God. And therefore, because it's from God, to be consistent with the view, you have to say it's infallible. Because when God speaks, it's infallible. The problem is you then have to take the download, right? The revelation, and then you have to interpret it, right? So you're doing your exegesis of the vision, your exegesis of the dream, the revelation in this realm of prophecy, and your interpretation could be flawed, just like somebody could interpret a text in a flawed way in the, you know, in the realm of teaching. And then your application, well, you could misapply it. You could say that the person needs to do such and such when really the, the person needs to do uh, this, that, and the other. And, and so they would say, because of that, this is the banner of New Testament prophecy. And because of that, prophecy, because it always includes a perfect revelation from the Lord, but a fallible interpretation and a fallible application from man, prophecy is therefore, New Testament prophecy is not perfect. Therefore, two or three should prophesy. The rest should weigh what's being said. And, you know, and it's, you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt. What, how would you respond to that? <laughs> I know that's a lot, but that's, that's kind of the, the third wave, right? That's your Wayne Grudem. That's your John Piper. Mm -hmm. That's your Jack Deere, Sam Storms, mm -hmm. all those kinds of guys. I feel like I've been fair. I, I wanted to be as fair as possible to their position. And, uh, and a lot of my listeners are cessationists. And so a lot of them, I, I wanted them just to hear that because they, maybe they've never even heard that position mm -hmm. fleshed out. So how would you respond to that and say, well, I think that's unbiblical because, or I think there's some problems with that because. Sure. So again, I, I go back to two thoughts. First of all, I think in the realm of teaching, that's spot on. That's exactly what happens when, you know, on the Lord's day, we, oh, we stand before our people. We have studied, we have prayed, we have asked for the Spirit's help. We have taken the revelation that God has given. We have sought to interp interpret it accurately, to interpret it rightly. And then we proclaim it and we press it home in the lives of those who hear us. Zero disagreement. If you say that that's what's happening in prophecy, though, if you're going to use this term prophecy, right. well, let's go back to how prophecy happens in the Bible. That's right. When the prophets speak, Old Testament and New Testament alike, they speak in God's name. They say, thus says the Lord. And I was talking with some of our guys, I um, get together with a few men in our church, we're reading through systematic theology at the moment. And we were just talking about this last Sunday. The, when you see that formula, thus says the Lord in the Bible, there is an authority there. This is no longer just the words of the prophet as he's seeking to make sense of what God is saying. No, this is God has spoken. 
if you're saying, okay, God is speaking to you or the Lord is telling me to tell you, there's a measure of authority there where that interpretation line kind of doesn't apply here because God is speaking clearly. Right. So that'll be my first thing. You're kind of blurring lines where I think, if, and this is where you have to, in their system anyway, create a big dichotomy between prophecy in the Old Testament and prophecy in the New. Because if you just take prophecy to be prophecy, well, you don't see much in the way of interpretation. In fact, he's not supposed to interpret. Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah's explicit. Listen, the person who said they had a dream should say they had a dream. That's right. And the person who says they have my word should speak my word. Mm -hmm. So that would be my first response. I would say, secondly, in terms of the flow of redemptive history, aren't we going backwards, not forwards? And what I mean by that is, um, we'll get to my own personal story, I imagine, as we go. One of the texts that made me start re-examining all of this was Hebrews chapter 1. So in Hebrews chapter 1, it says, God, who in previous times and in many ways spoke to the fathers of the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Right. The writer to the Hebrews contrasts the way that God spoke in previous ages, and he says it was at many times and in many different ways. Mm. What you described to me with, okay, it could be this, it could be this, it could right. be this, it could be this, it could be this, that sounds more like going backwards in redemptive history, right? not going forwards in redemptive history. Because whereas there was this, you know, mosaic, as it were, of time and this mosaic of method, when we get to New Testament revelation, I think the authors of the Hebrews makes a very interesting case that what we encounter is God has spoken through his son. Mm. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, yes, he's spoken to the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus then gave authority to his apostles to teach in his behalf. And obviously the spirit of Christ was inspiring, inspiring the people in the Old Testament. And so we have that speaking of the son in the completed scripture that we have. Right. That would be my contention on a secondary level. So those would be the two things I would invite my charismatic friend there who's saying that to consider. Mm -hmm. You're blurring a line where I don't think the New Testament blurs that line. And you're going backwards in redemptive history, not forwards. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you would consider supporting Right Response Ministries, we'd be incredibly grateful. You can do so by going to rightresponseministries.com slash donate to give your gift of any amount. If you're not able to support us financially, that's okay. You can still support us in a great regard simply by subscribing to our YouTube channel, clicking the bell, and of course sharing our content with all your friends and family. We can't do this without you, your support, and your prayers. So thank you.